It may not be the steepest, the longest, or the highest climb in the Tour de France, but the Col de Tourmalet is certainly one of the most iconic in the race. And who better to talk to than Peter Cousins, award-winning author, recently award-winning author, local Pyrenean climb and cycling journalist. So, Pete, what have we got in store? Like you say, Paul, it's, uh, it's iconic. The Tour's been up there uh, 85, 86 times. In 1974, Frenchman Jean-Pierre Donguillaume won there. People will remember perhaps in 2010 when uh, Andy Schleck and uh, Alberto Contador duked it out up the final slopes in, in the fog. Yeah, I mean, like you say, completely iconic. Definitely, and this, of course, one of the giants of the Pyrenees, and where better to stay than where we are right now, which is La Closier B&B in Le Bar de Ness. If you're looking for a cycling holiday in the area, this is the place to come. As the Tourmalet has so much history in the race, we're not just going to be riding both sides, we've got to talk about how it's affected the race in the past. But first of all, both sides are quite similar in um, length and gradient, but they do differ quite dramatically. Just in, in, the, terms in the makeup, of... yeah. The, the, the side, uh, the eastern side, which you tackle from Saint Marie de Campan, is uh, you start off with quite a gentle introduction to it. It's quite nice actually. And then there are a lot of steep ramps when you kind of get further up on the climb towards La Mangie, the resort. Whereas if, when you come from Luz Saint Sauveur on the, on the western side, it's much, much steadier, but kind of a steeper gradient for, for longer. Early today, we took on the eastern side of the Tourmalet from Saint Marie de Campagne, and let's see how we got on. Here we are in Saint Marie de Campagne, a very damp and wet Saint Marie de Campagne, which is the base of the eastern ascent of the Col de Tourmalet. We're stood by quite interesting statue and Pete. This gentleman here is, uh, as you can see, if you can read the inscription here, is, is Eugene Christophe. And this statue commemorates his incident on the Col de Tourmalet in 1913 when he broke his forks. Uh, we're, we're at the bottom of the Tourmalet here. He was 10 kilometers up that way somewhere. Ran down the Tourmalet with his bike on his shoulder to the forge, which is just around the corner, maybe 200 meters down that way on the right hand side. There's a plaque on the wall. And he spent a couple of hours fixing his forks, then managed to get back in the race. I think he, it took him about four hours in the end. And then he finally got penalised because uh, you're not supposed to have any assistance at that time. And he asked a young lad who was working in the forge, the blacksmith's apprentice, to, uh, to help him work the bellows. And that was seen as giving him assistance so that he could actually fettle his, his forks back to shape. Sounds so, very harsh. So extremely very, very harsh, harsh, yeah. Very harsh. That must have been a long 10 kilometre walk down the climb. Hopefully we won't be walking up any of the mountain today because we've got two very slick looking bikes here. So I'm riding the Ribble Endurance SL and Pete, you've got the Ribble Endurance SLR. And we better go and test these two fine machines. Indeed, and yeah. What's that sign say? 16.9 kilometers to the top. So we just be better get cracking. Off we go. This is the Ribble Endurance SL E-Tap, and as its name suggests, comes with full 11-speed SRAM Red E-Tap. It also comes with S900 A1 rim caliper brakes, which are part of the lightest group set on the market today. Perfect for us as we scale these Pyrenean mountains. The bike's sleek look is completed with level five carbon bars and stem, which are perfect for punching an aerodynamic hole in the air. This is also the choice of the Ribble Pro Cycling team. So fingers crossed it has as much success for us in France as it does for them back on home soil. We're about nine kilometers from the summit of the eastern side of the Col de Tourmalet. And as you can see, the conditions could be a bit friendlier. We're uh, riding through the mist, maybe even the cloud now. We're getting quite high up. And yeah, it's a bit damp as well. But yeah, I mean, it's quite a nice gentle start to the climb, isn't it? Yeah, you start off from uh, St. Marie de Campagne where the little monuments paying tribute to Eugene Christophe are. And you get maybe three or four K there where it's between two and 4%. Nice gentle start, but then you're kind of thinking, hang on, the kilometers are ticking down, not gaining much altitude, what's coming next? Yeah, so there's signs every kilometer telling you how high up you are, what the percentages for the next kilometer as well. And it's very nice seeing 
three and a half percent but it's not very nice seeing the summit 2000 over 2100 meters and you're still in the low 1000s with a long way to go but we're making good progress now and uh hopefully the weather may clear with any luck yeah it'd be nice we're getting to the point now where we'll turn into the ravine where Le Mongi sits the resort and on a clear day you'd be able to see right up there today I don't suppose we're going to see anything which maybe that's to our advantage because it's <laughs> one of the steepest bits of the climb so yeah exactly you can only hope but yeah we're about about half hour into the climb give or take maybe and uh, the KOM on the eastern side is set by David Godot which is 50 minutes just over the 50 minutes so yeah he's going he was going pretty quick that day I can imagine and uh, yeah we're just chugging past the yeah 8k to go Pete's attacking on the inside line clearly this is where he's putting me in the pain cave already <laughs> the first time the Tourmalet was introduced to the Tour de France route was 1910 and there's quite an intriguing story into how it got onto the route that year isn't there there is indeed they, they sent a, a man called Alphonse Steinitz from Paris to go and do a recce to see whether they could actually get over the Tourmalet and this was in, in January, so in the middle of winter, Steinez arrived at the foot of the Tourmalet, asked locals, like, how do I get up the pass? And they're like, you don't get up the pass, it's, it's close. And he said, no, no, I need to get up there. So a car sort of drove him most of the way. Then he struggled on and, and got almost to the top, I think, and then got lost, fell into a ravine. A search party was sent out. They managed to guide him back down at like three or four in the morning and, and kind of warm him up, give him some give him some food and then the next morning when he got up he, he sent a, a very famous uh, telegram to Paris yes which said cross Tourmalet very good road perfectly passable signed Steiners which uh, I don't know if he uh, <laughs> actually <laughs> meant that or whether he was just afraid of what may come if he said no don't go up there yeah. it's horrendous I mean, it's, it's interesting as well because when they actually did go up there late in that summer they, uh, they obviously arrived there in, in July and the first man over the top who was Octave Lapiz, there's a, a, a plaque to him at the, at the summit now, um, he rode across the top first man and he shouted across to the, uh, to the race judges standing at the top, assassins! <laughs> so I think we've just started into the uh, hardest kilometre so far, 10%. Yeah, double digits, first time. But it's also changing landscape as well, isn't it? Well, you can't really tell, but... I'm reliably informed by yourself. Yeah, uh, it's funny the Tourmalet because people often debate which is the hardest side and you can, there are arguments for both sides, but in terms of landscape, they're quite different. Somewhere out over there I'm waving at, there's uh, quite a narrow, we're going up quite a narrow gorge. Whereas on the other side, it's very, very open indeed. Really beautiful, you kind of go into a big circus approach, what they call a circus, yeah. a circ. Oh, looks like we've got a few, uh, few guests here. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Salut. Ali, ali, ali. Well, at least we've dropped one person, one, one thing today, I should say. There have been other finishes on the Colder Tourmalet, just not at the summit, most notably at Le Mangie, which has hosted three stage finishes in the race's history. That's right, the first one in 1970 when Bernard Tevenet won what I think was his first stage win in the Tour de France. He went on to win the, the race twice overall. And then much more recently, 2002, where uh, a certain Lance Armstrong won there. 2004, Ivan Basso won there with, I think, Lance just, just on his wheels. So, yeah, it does, it does have... Uh, some decent history behind it, La Mangie as well. I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty ugly place as, as ski <laughs> resorts go. They, they don't tend to be great, but La Mangie, it does have an East European look to it, I would guess. Very 1970s, very kind of concrete, not attractive at all, but uh, certainly got some cycling history to it. Here we are, top of the Tourmalet. And it is absolutely freezing. The snow is pouring down. And I mean, you can see on the statue of uh, Lapiz there, the snow is still laying on him. And uh, yeah, I mean, what a brute of a climb that was. So as uh, the snow is coming down and there's a lot of uh, motorcycles appearing around us, I think it's better time that we move off and Find get into the wall. Yes, get some fuel back in us before we uh, come up the other side.
as you can probably tell from our faces at the top of the climb, we weren't in the best of moods to hang around. We kind of just wanted to get moving as it was so cold, but it was a pretty epic ascent, wasn't it? It was epic, yeah, it was grim. It was a bit overwhelming at the top because of the, the snow that was coming down, but yeah. it was kind of worth it in the end, yeah. yeah. It's got that reputation of, of the weather changing very quickly, even from one pass to another. I mean, I know when Contador and Schleck had their duel on to, in 2010 on the, on the western side, the journalists were over on the eastern side at La Mange sitting in the sun thinking, where's all this fog come from that they're racing up in? So that's the Pyrenees for you. Yeah, exactly. And as you may have noticed, Pete in a late attack dropped me when we got to the, the pure altitude of the climb and strong legs, it looked good. But yeah, that was the eastern side. So now there's only one thing to do, let's check out the western side. Well, what a difference a mere matter of hours. Mate, it does not feel like I'm in the same place, to be honest, from the snow of the eastern side to the sun and probably sunburn of the uh, west. And the, the lovely tailwind we've got blowing us up here. It's, it's perfect, perfect day to, uh, to tackle the tourmalade. Yeah, I mean, the, it doesn't actually get any easier. We're, we're saying all the positives now. It's still averaging 7.4%. And that side there says 18 kilometers to the top. So I don't know how big a tailwind we're going to get, but it probably won't be a, we're still going to have to put a, fair bit of Let, effort in. Let's hope you just hang with it, yeah. It's the 50th anniversary of Eddie Merckx's first victory. It's the centenary of the, the yellow jersey. When he rode over the, the Tourmalet in 1969, he, he led the race over. I, he, I don't think he was intending to, but he had his, uh, his team on the front, the Multaney team, riding up the, uh, the Tourmalet. And a, a teammate, uh, Martin van den Bosser, decided that he was going to attack or kind of push on and take the glory of leading the race over the Tourmalet. Unfortunately, as the story goes, Van den Bosser had let Merckx know a couple of days before that he was going to be leaving the team at the end of the season. So Merckx wasn't exactly happy with this. So basically rode past his teammate, rode over the Tourmalet on his own, saw that there was nobody behind him and just kind of pressed on, went down the descent, headed to the Obisk, started riding up the Obisk and he extended his lead, I mean, to, to minutes by this point, reached the top of the Obisk, and then descended down to Moronx, which is a, a town kind of almost right over towards the Atlantic coast, right across that side, and finished nine minutes ahead of everybody on his own. <laughs> We're about just over halfway up the climb now, and if you're visiting the Pyrenees, this is quite a a useful spot to take note of because the road actually forks off, doesn't it? And there's good reason for it. Yeah, this is actually, uh, this is the old road here. So when the tour came up here in 2010, when Andy Schleck won, this is the, the route they followed to the top, up the right-hand side of the valley. The road was washed away in 2013, or parts of it were, and it's actually, they converted it into a bike-only path. So if you want to ride up the Tourmalet with no traffic at all. It's one way, so nobody's going to be descending towards you either. You can follow this route up the right-hand side of the valley for three and a half, four kilometers for just a really quiet experience of the Tourmalet. But for us, we're just going to carry on up the main road to the top. Follow the way the pros go. We're uh, just coming up to the three kilometres to go mark here. It's just around the next bend. And we've still got 300 metres of vertical ascent, so you can work that sum out for yourself. It's a pretty easy one. <laughs> Obviously, we're getting up towards 2,000 metres. Just got a glimpse of the, uh, of the telecoms mass up on the Peak de Midi, but that's disappeared into the, uh, into the cloud again. 
It's absolutely gorgeous looking back down. So we're about two and a half K from the summit now on the western ascent. Very different conditions to what we uh, climbed the eastern side on. But Pete, <laughs> what would you say, if you could pick between them, is the easier or harder side out of the two? I don't think, I couldn't pick between them. I think they're pretty even. The one way I think they can be separated is in the terrain, in the landscape. I mean, looking back, down to my left now, towards Super Barrage, which you can see the ski resort down below, or I can see. It's just absolutely stunning. You don't really get these same views on the eastern side. I just think this is spectacular up here. This is what the tour's all about for me, yeah. looking back down there. No, this is why you ride a bike, and it's, it'll be all worth it in about two kilometers time. Second time up, probably wasn't as easy. I don't know, I don't know about you, but that was uh, lived up to its name for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, people talk about which is the easiest side. I think they're pretty much the same. There, yep. are, there are steep ramps on both sides. Neither side's easy. The last bit coming up on this side here, on the, on the western side is brutal, so. Yeah, it uh, surely lives up to its name. And yeah, like I mentioned yesterday, it's probably the hardest side is whatever you're riding at that time, moment in time and indeed yeah yeah and as you can see we were obviously bragging about how nice the weather was coming up the western side but the cloud has closed in and it almost looks the same as when we came up here not that long ago with the snow pouring it's surely yeah you know, like you said it's a bit, a bit spooky up here as well it's also a bit weird not having hordes of cyclists motorcyclists battling for the sign here and a photo next to octave lapis when uh Yesterday, even when we were in the snow, there was people coming up here, but no, it's just, uh, no, but what a climb. That's why it uh, lives up to his name. That's why the tour comes here pretty much every single year. But yeah, thank you, Pete, for being the guide and letting me ride on your wheel Thanks on so most sides and not embarrassing me too much. So uh, <laughs> no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasurable, but pretty painful. But thank you as well for watching and uh, do like and share this video. And don't forget to subscribe to the Cycling Weekly channel. But until next time, thank you for watching again and we'll see you later.